The early 2000s were a special time in the world of snowboarding. As a previously underground sport that was finally hitting the mainstream, there was a massive boom in its popularity. With this industry growth also came the emergence of several big names in the sport. And at the time, few names were as big as Kevin Pierce. Coming in first place, Mr. Kevin Pierce! Not surprisingly, you won it. Kevin Pierce! That guy is solid as they come. Unfortunately, while some riders would go on to fulfill long and prolific careers in snowboarding, Kevin's career would sadly be cut short, and the events leading up to the end of his career, as well as the way in which it ended, would ultimately expose a much darker side of snowboarding. Growing up in Vermont, it seems natural that Kevin was already riding snowboards by age 5. His family had deep ties in the snowboarding community, and he spent his entire childhood up on the mountains. But Kevin doesn't have the same prodigy story as a lot of top athletes. For most of his early years, Kevin wasn't considered a very gifted rider at all, and he wouldn't even begin riding competitively until his mid-teens. Skill-wise, his older brothers and his friends were much better than he was. However, somewhere along the line, this dynamic began to change. In the 8th grade, Kevin somehow managed to convince his parents to let him move to Mammoth with his 18-year-old brother, allowing him to snowboard full-time and do schoolwork during the off-season, a move that proved to be a major boost for his career. Unsurprisingly, as he increased his riding time, he also increased his skill level. Kevin would spend more time on the mountain than anyone else around him. He was the first one on the mountain in the morning and the last one off the mountain at night. He made a constant effort to go ride as much as possible, even when the weather conditions were bad. Not because he was training to be better, but because he was genuinely having fun. This effort eventually paid off. As Kevin rapidly became a better rider in his teens, he soon started competing, and it didn't take long for him to start collecting some major wins. Kevin Pierce, always a pleasure to watch. Yeah. Oh, Kevin Pierce oh. is on fire right now. By age 17, Kevin claimed back-to-back -back victories at the Arctic Challenge Contest, as well as two silver medals and a bronze medal at the 2008 X Games. This winning streak helped him gain a long list of big name sponsorships, along with hundreds of thousands of dollars in prize money and endorsement deals. He was a key figure in a newly budding movement in the snowboarding world, and there was a lot of excitement about him possibly competing in the Olympics. At the time, professional snowboarder Sean White was dominating the scene. He was winning almost every major contest season after season. And not only was he winning, but he was winning by a wide margin. As Kevin emerged on the contest circuit as a solid contender, a narrative quickly began to form. Kevin Pierce would be the one to finally beat Sean White. See, Kevin was a part of the Friends crew, a group of snowboarders purely focused on having fun snowboarding, even going as far as spelling the word friends without the letter I, since they don't see it as an individual thing. In interviews, Kevin spoke about this a lot. From a young age, snowboarding was something I did for fun. I never thought of it as anything more than that. It wasn't until the last couple of years that it's turned into a career. This is all about having each other's back and cruising together. If we don't win, it's not the end of the world. This was a stark contrast to Sean White's approach, who was widely seen as a fierce competitor who was more focused on winning than making friends in the community. In several major contests, Kevin was surprisingly able to outrank Sean White, which for years didn't even seem possible. Taking out Sean there, you know, that was my first major half pipe win. Deja vu last year, was able to put that one down. Sean was in first and just uh, just snuck in there. Whew, I'm happy, man. When it became clear that Kevin was an Olympic hopeful, people started to wonder if he would be the one to finally take out Sean White on the global stage. After all, Kevin was doing some of the hardest tricks in snowboarding. He was inventing new tricks. And for most people, it seemed like he had a great chance at winning an Olympic gold medal. Sadly, before anyone would be able to see these events play out, a single slam would cause his entire career to be cut short. There are a lot of risks involved with snowboarding, and there are also risks involved with using the internet without a VPN, which is where today's sponsor Surfshark comes in handy. But what do they actually do? Well, Surfshark prevents websites from tracking you, it encrypts your data, it makes public Wi-Fi safer to use, and it gives you access to more content by allowing you to set your location to another country. For example, a lot of content is blocked based on the country you live in, even in places like the US, UK, and Canada. By changing your location, you're able to gain access to tons of content that would otherwise be unavailable. 
Not only that, since it encrypts your data and prevents websites from tracking you, it can also prevent annoying ads and stop companies from charging you more just because you visited their website in the past. Surfshark gives you access to a bunch of great features bundled into a single subscription that you can use on unlimited devices at the same time. Right now, they have an exclusive Black Friday deal where you can enter promo code DUSTED to get up to six additional months for free at surfshark.deal dusted. On December 31st, 2009, while working on a new trick called the double cork, a trick where the rider does two flips and three and a half spins, Kevin caught the toe edge of his board and slammed directly into the ground. This resulted in a six day coma where it was unclear whether he would even live. His eye was totally swollen. He blew his pupil out, which is a sign of a massive head trauma. It's just not looking good. He would spend a total of 26 days in intensive care and several months in the hospital, where he would have to relearn how to speak, walk, and do most basic functions without the help of someone else. As a result of his fall, Kevin suffered from a traumatic brain injury, otherwise known as a TBI. TBIs have been very common in sports, especially action sports, essentially since they were invented. However, there's still a lot about them that's not understood. Almost immediately after he regained consciousness, Kevin's first priority was getting back to snowboarding. When could he go back to riding? What did he need to do to win a gold medal? He had almost no concern for his own well-being. What he didn't yet know at the time was that it would be a solid two years before he would even step foot on a snowboard. And when he finally did ride again, a harsh realization would set in that his days of competing were over. Just as he had forgotten how to walk and talk, he had also forgotten the lifetime of skills that he had learned leading up to his accident. Sure, he could still cruise around, but not anywhere close to the level he was previously at. Despite going through years of rehab, his brain and his body simply weren't the same. Not only that, but the risk involved were significantly higher. See, after someone suffers from one traumatic brain injury, the dangers of suffering from another one are much greater. Not only is it easier to damage your brain if you fall a second time, but the injuries it might sustain are far worse as well. Simply put, there is no way Kevin would ever be able to compete again. His brain was in such a fragile state that simply riding around was dangerous, so risking slamming while trying to relearn tricks just wasn't an option. Kevin's lifelong dreams were crushed. Losing snowboarding is definitely the hardest thing that I've ever had to deal with in my life. It's almost like a part of me is missing. For his entire life, he dreamed of being a professional snowboarder and winning an Olympic gold medal. Snowboarding wasn't just his career, it was also his identity. And in his early 20s, he was having to face the harsh reality that those dreams were over. As sad as his situation was though, there are hundreds if not thousands of other athletes that suffer from even worse TBIs every single year. And relatively speaking, Kevin was one of the lucky ones. Champion freestyle skier Sarah Burke. She is in critical condition right now after an accident on a training run left her with a traumatic brain injury. For champion skier Sarah Burke, nine days after a terrible crash has died. Well, Sarah Burke, her life cut tragically short this week when she died after being first seriously injured in practice. On January 10th, 2012, professional skier Sarah Burke was seriously injured while training on a superpipe in Park City, Utah. The same exact superpipe where Kevin Pierce was almost fatally injured just a few years earlier. Sadly, unlike Kevin, Sarah passed away soon after her fall, and the world of skiing lost one of its most loved professionals. With these two high-profile crashes happening so close to each other at the same exact location, people started to question the standards in snowboarding. When competitive snowboarding first started out, ramps were at a modest height. These days, the average superpipe is 22 feet high, with other ramps spanning close to 100 feet in length. On top of that, riders often go 10 to 20 feet higher than the actual ramp. This means professional snowboarders are going 40 to 50 miles per hour, then launching off of ramps that easily send them 30 to 50 feet in the air. When you consider the dangers involved, it begins to raise some ethical questions about competitive snowboarding in general. To become a top athlete in snowboarding, it takes an incredible amount of dedication. So if you make the ramp taller or make a jump bigger, professional snowboarders aren't going to question it. They're just going to try to figure out how to rise to the occasion. For the first few years of Kevin's recovery, he was still convinced that he would eventually ride competitively again. Doctors told him the risk involved, they told him that he could potentially die if he fell again, but he was determined to get back on the board. It wasn't until he finally realized his skill level simply wasn't there anymore that he finally decided to not pursue it. If for some reason he could still ride at a high level, he likely would have competed, even with the risk involved. 
As crazy as it seems, Kevin isn't the only person with this thought process. The kind of person who becomes a professional athlete loves what they do, and they're not going to stop simply because it becomes more dangerous. Not only that, but the money, fame, and accolades that come along with being a top performer are often a strong incentive, especially with young athletes. While most fans of a sport want to see it reach its full potential, eventually some questions start to arise. Should we allow athletes to risk their lives in competition? Are athletes capable of making the judgment themselves? Is it wrong to entice young competitors with millions of dollars? These are difficult questions to answer, but seeing injuries like Kevin's makes them hard to ignore. Hopefully though, by paying attention to Kevin's story and others like his, more conversations will be had that will eventually lead to progress being made.